Hey guys, Justin here. Before the video, I just wanted to let you know that all the footage in this video was taken from a marathon live stream we did on the main channel, where Michael did seven final exams from seven classes. If you're interested in watching the entire stream, it will be linked in the description. Hope you enjoy. So for our first calculus two problem, we'll start with something that happens generally at the beginning of calculus two, which is an integration by parts type problem. So let's look at the integral from one to four of e to the square root of x dx. Okay, so how can we do this? I think our best bet is to start with a substitution. So I'll set t equal to the square root of x. Notice that means that x is equal to t squared, which means that dx is equal to 2t dt. The reason I solve for x here is because once I make this substitution, t equals the square root of x, I've used up all of my x's inside of the integral. So I can't like pick off the remaining x's by calculating dt in terms of x. So that means I need to flip around my substitution, kind of solve for the other term. Okay, then let's maybe keep going here. Notice that when x is equal to one, we see that t is equal to one because the square root of one is one. And when x is equal to four, we see that t is equal to two because the square root of four is two. Okay, so that's looking good. Now, what do we have? We have two times the integral from one up to two of t times e to the t dt. So we're left with something like this. Now we can integrate this using integration by parts. And of course, like there's this DI method or this tabular method, but I think that method is really popular on the internet. So let's maybe do it with traditional integration by parts because I hear there's some like old school professors out there. I'm not one of them that likes to see it written out in detail. So let's just maybe do it like that just for those people. So we've got a polynomial times an exponential function. If we've got a polynomial times an exponential function, that motivates us to choose u to be the polynomial. So that would be t in this case. And dv will be the exponential. So that'll be e to the t dt. Then we'll calculate du is equal to the number one times dt. So I'll just write dt. And then v is equal to the antiderivative of that. Well, that will be e to the t. Now we'll use our standard formula. The integral of u dv is uv minus the integral of v du. So what does that leave us here? We've got this two out in front of everything. We have u times v, so that'll be t times e to the t minus the integral from one to two. Sorry, this should be evaluated from one to two. Then minus the integral from one to two of v du. So that'll be e to the t dt. Okay, so that's good. Now we can maybe plug these in. That'll leave us with two. And then we have two e squared minus e from this first term, and then minus e to the t evaluated from one to two. So something like that. Now I think when all is said and done, we'll have two e squared. I think I like skip some steps there, but it should be okay. Plugging a two in here, we'll get e squared. So we've got two e squared minus e squared. That's one e squared multiplied by another two is two e squared. Plugging a one in, we'll get an e to the one, but that's in the lower bound of integration, which turns this minus to a plus, that'll cancel that. So I believe this is the right answer. If it's not, I made a mistake at the very end, but I think we're good to go there. Okay, so now let's do another integral. So let's do an indefinite integral this time or an antiderivative. And this is gonna involve um, a partial fractions decomposition. So that's a classic thing that you might see in an integral calculus class or a calculus two class. So let's look at the integral of x plus one over x squared times x minus one dx. Okay. So let's do our partial fraction decomposition calculation like off to the side. We'll just do it down here. We have x plus one over x squared over, sorry, times x minus one. So this should decompose as capital A over x plus capital B over x squared plus capital C over x minus one. 
So we've got this equation of rational functions. But what we'd like to do is take this equation of rational functions and turn it into an equation of polynomials. And we'll do that by multiplying both sides of this equation by x squared times x minus 1. That'll clear our denominators. So let's see, that'll leave us with an x plus 1 over there on the left-hand side of the equation. And then we'll have a times x times x minus 1. When we multiply into this first term, we'll have plus b times x minus 1 when multiplying into this second term. And then we'll have plus cx squared when multiplying into this third term. Okay, but notice we've got a quadratic polynomial on the right-hand side and a linear polynomial on the left-hand side. So now let's extract the x squared terms, the x terms, and the constant terms from both sides of this equation. And I'll just put the number 1 to mean our constant terms. So let's start with the x squared terms, and I think we can just eyeball it. So over here on the right-hand side, we have a times x times x, so that will be just a times x squared. And then we'll have c times x squared, so a plus c. So that's the x squared terms on the right-hand side. But on the left-hand side, there are no x squared terms, so we have zero. Now let's look at the x terms. So over here on the right-hand side, we have a times x times minus 1. Over here, we have b times x. So we have b minus a equals 1. That's because over here, the coefficient of x is 1. Now let's look at our constant term. So on the right-hand side, we have a single constant term. That is negative b. And then over here, we've got only a single constant term here, and that is also just the number 1. So let's see, negative b is 1, but if negative b is 1, that means b is equal to negative 1. Okay, but now we can go from there pretty easily. If b is equal to negative 1, we can plug that up here, and we'll see pretty quickly that a is equal to negative 2. Is that right? Yeah, that's right. But then if a is equal to negative 2, we quickly see that c is equal to positive 2. So that means in our decomposition, we have a negative 2 right here. We have, let's see, b is a negative 1 right here, and then c should be a 2 right here. So that's good. Now let's rewrite our integral using this decomposition. That gives us the integral of negative 2 over x dx. Well, maybe we'll put it all together. And then minus 1 over x squared, and then plus 2 over x minus 1. But each of those, we know how to take the antiderivative. Two of them are natural logs, and the remaining one will use the power rule. So this will give us minus 2 times the natural log of the absolute value of x. Recall when you take the antiderivative of something like this, you pick up a, uh, an absolute value. And then we'll have plus 1 over x. So think about this. This is x to the minus 1. So the minus 1 is gobbled up by taking that antiderivative. And then finally, plus 2 times the natural log of the absolute value of x minus 1, and then plus a constant. So that would be our final value of this integral. OK. So now let's quickly do some converge-diverge problems. So for series. So since we're just saying like, if these converge or diverge, I think we can do these without as much um, written down. So maybe we'll put a heading for this. Converge, diverge. So let's start with this one. So this is the sum as n goes from one to infinity of one over the cube root of n squared. Okay, so notice that this also can be written as the sum as n goes from 1 to infinity of 1 over n to the 2 thirds. Is that right? Yeah, that's right. But notice that 2 thirds is less than 1, which means this diverges 
by the P-series test. Recall the P-series test says that the sum of one over n to the P converges if P is strictly bigger than one and it diverges if P is less than or equal to one. So diverges if P is less than or equal to one, converges if P is strictly bigger than one. So this one diverges, okay. So let's look at the next one. So this will be the sum as n goes from one up to infinity of minus one to the n times n over n squared plus one. So this is an alternating series. So this motivates us to use the alternating series test. So notice that it's alternating. That's the first thing that we need in order to use the alternating series test. Another thing that we need is for the terms to tend towards zero. So let's notice that the limit as n goes to infinity of n over n squared plus one is equal to zero. So the terms tend towards zero. And then we also need to show that it's a decreasing sequence. So that's the last thing. So let's set a sub n equal to n over n squared plus one. And then what we want to show here is that a sub n plus one is less than a sub n. So notice that that is going to be equivalent to n plus one over n plus one quantity squared plus one is less than n over n squared plus one. But let's notice that's equivalent to what we get when we multiply things out. So n plus one over n squared plus two n plus two is less than n over n squared plus one. Okay, but now we can maybe cross multiply. So that's gonna be equivalent to n plus one times n squared plus one being less than n maybe cubed plus two n squared plus two n. Then we can multiply this out. So if we multiply this out, we'll get n cubed. And then what do we get after that? We'll get, sorry, n cubed plus n squared plus n plus one. But then we can move some things around. Notice that things cancel. This n cubed will cancel this n cubed. This two n squared will cancel this down. This n will cancel that down. And we'll see that this is equivalent to one being less than n squared plus n after moving this over. But this is a true statement. So n squared plus n is most definitely bigger than one for all n bigger than or equal to one. So since this inequality is true, this inequality is true, this inequality is true, this inequality is true, and finally, we have a decreasing sequence. So this, since this is a decreasing sequence, and we also know that it limits to zero and it's alternating, we know that this thing converges. So converges by the alternating series test. So that's pretty good. Okay, so now let's do two more. Let's do the sum as n goes from one to infinity of cosine of three over n. Well, immediately we can say this diverges. So diverges, and that's because the limit as n goes to infinity of the cosine of three over n is equal to the cosine of zero, which is one. We can bring that limit inside because cosine is a continuous function, but one is not equal to zero. And so this diverges by something called the test for divergence. So if the terms of a series do not tend towards zero, the series diverges. <clears throat> of course, the converse is not true. And in fact, this example right here is an example of the converse not being true. Okay, let's do maybe one more, but I don't think we have room right here. So let's do it up here on the other side. Let's look at the sum as n goes from one to infinity of n times two to the n over n factorial. So here we'll use the ratio test 
And the motivation for using the ratio test here is, well, first of all, this has a factorial and factorial or series that are defined with factorials often like really work well with the ratio test. Another hint is that it's not only a factorial, but it's a mixture of a factorial with some other things as well. That also motivates the ratio test. Okay, so let's look at the limit as n goes to infinity of the nth term over the n plus first term. Or is it the, it's the n plus first term over the nth term. So let's see, that'll be n plus one times two to the n plus one over n plus one factorial. It actually doesn't matter what order you do it in, you could just restate the ratio test to make it work either way. Okay, so this would be the n plus first term over the nth term. So n times two to the n over n factorial. Now I'm gonna rewrite this so all the things that are like each other are um, dividing each other. So this is the same thing as the limit as n goes to infinity of of n factorial over n plus one factorial. So I grouped my n, my factorial terms together. And then next I'll group my polynomial terms together. That'll be n plus one over n. And then last I'll group my exponential terms together. That will be two to the n uh, plus one over two to the n, okay. But now let's notice that this n plus one factorial can be expanded out to n plus one times n factorial. Then the n factorial terms cancel and this two to the n can cancel this down to just the number two. We can factor that number two out and we're left with the limit as n goes to infinity of um, n plus one, oh, and the n plus one and the n plus one can cancel that night, that's nice, so we just have one over n. That limit is very clearly equal to zero. But since zero is strictly less than one, we know that this thing converges. Remember that the ratio test says that this converges if this limit is less than one, diverges if it's bigger than one, and then there's no information if it uh, is equal to one. Well, not that there's no information, but this test is itself inconclusive. Okay, so now let's do the next one. So let's find a Taylor series. So find the Maclaurin series. So remember a Maclaurin series is simply just a Taylor series based at zero. So let's say our function is f of x, which is equal to um, one over the cube root of x plus one. So you could calculate this using the standard coefficient rules for the Maclaurin series involving the higher and higher derivatives. But this is a special case, and this is a special case where we have a binomial series. So we could maybe rewrite this as x plus one to the one third. That would be a typical way to write this. Okay, but then we can expand this using binomial series. So this is equal to the sum as n goes from zero up to infinity of one third choose n x to the n. And that's really all there is to it, kind of depending on exactly how much more complicated you wanna write something like this. In my mind, that would be sufficient. Let's recall that one third choose n is the following object. This is one third times one third minus one all the way down to one third minus n plus one over n factorial. So this is a descending product of n total terms in the numerator starting at one third, and then we've got n factorial in the denominator. You could perhaps get some sort of closed form for that that doesn't look like a binomial coefficient, but I don't think it's super worth it. I think writing it like this is fine. Okay, so now let's maybe do this next part of this problem, which is use this to approximate um, the cube root of five with a, um, let's maybe just say a second degree polynomial. Yeah, so we could do a third degree polynomial or a fourth degree polynomial, but it's all about the same. 
So let's notice that f of x, um, I guess I should say maybe where this converges, that's like um, pretty important. So this converges when x is on the interval from minus one to one, the open interval. Okay, notice that it can't really be equal to minus one because that puts us a zero in the denominator. Okay, so now let's see that f of x is approximately equal to, um, let's see, one, which would be one third choose zero plus one third, which is one, choo one third choose one times x plus one third times negative two thirds over two factorial, which is two times x squared. So that's exactly using these binomial coefficients. And that's stopping there at our x squared term. So let's see, we can simplify this a little bit if we wanted to. This would be one plus one third times x, and then minus one over nine, times x squared. So we've got something that looks like that. And now let's say we want to approximate the cube root of five. So how could we do that? Well, notice that if we plug in something like negative four fifths into f of x, notice that, note that if we have the cube root of five, is the same thing as one over the cube root of one over five, you know, by arithmetic, but that's the same thing as one over the cube root of negative four over five plus one, you know, by more arithmetic, but that's equal to f evaluated at negative four fifths. But now that's gonna be approximately equal to this second degree polynomial evaluated there. So that'll be one plus one third times negative four fifths. So, I mean, this is where it gets sketchy because I'm bad at arithmetic quickly, but this is like minus four over 15 and then minus Let's see, five times five is 25 times nine is, what's 25 times nine? 225, um, so this is like minus 16 over two to five. Oh, thank you, thank you. So negative one third, negative one third, negative one third, negative one third. So that makes this a negative one third, uh, negative one third, negative four thirds. So this turns into a negative, a plus, two over nine, is that right? So this is plus four over 15, because putting the minus sign in, and then plus maybe something else, but I don't know exactly what it is. It's arithmetic at that point. So now let's find the area between the inner and outer loops of this function, r equals two cosine theta minus one. So this would be like a, uh, when you're doing polar coordinates or whatever. Okay, so we can sketch this real quick. So if we were to sketch this, it has this kind of nice picture here. So you have this like inner loop that we hinted at and then this outer loop like this. So this point right here, well, it's an R value of one, but it's also along the X axis at one. And this over here is an R value of three, and it's along the X axis at three. The theta value right here, we can calculate. So that this theta value when we're out here is something like uh, zero. So this would be theta equals zero. Whereas back here at the origin, we get uh, theta equals pi over three. So theta equals pi over three. Um, and that's because cosine of pi over three is a half. We get two times a half minus one. Okay, so now if we integrate from zero to pi over three, that's like finding this area right here. Then I just realized that I calculated only the inner loop. So let's not find the area between them. Let's find the area of the inner loop. Yeah, that's what I meant to have written here. So of the inner loop. 
and this should give you sort of enough information to figure out the area of the rest of it as well. Okay, so let's see. We'll integrate from zero to pi over three. So our area will be twice the integral from zero to pi over three. So it's in fact twice that of r over 2 d theta. So inside the area formula for polar curves, there's this half built in and then there's this r built in. Actually, it's an r squared built in. So this half will cancel with this 2, and that'll give us the integral from 0 to pi over 3 of r squared d theta. Now, this r squared will square this function right here. That'll give us the integral from zero to pi thirds of four cosine squared theta minus four cosine theta uh, plus one, just by multiplying that out, d theta. So now let's see where we can go from there. So now we'd probably like to use a power reducing formula for the cosine squared. So that'll give us the integral from zero to pi over three. So four cosine squared is the same thing as two times two cosine squared, but two times two cosine squared, well two cosine squared can be written as cosine of two theta plus one. So this gives us two cosine of two theta plus two, but then we can add that two to this one here, so it's plus three. Okay, so that comes from the power reducing formula on this, as well as the number one there. So just to reiterate, we use the fact that two cosine squared theta was equal to cosine two theta plus one, and then we have minus four cosine theta. So minus four cos theta, and then d theta. And now uh, we're essentially good to go. We can just take the antiderivative and plug the numbers in. So this will give us something like the sine of two theta from taking the antiderivative of this plus three theta and then minus four times the sine of theta. And then, like I said, evaluated from zero to pi thirds. Good. And then maybe I won't work those numbers out. Um, I think that's okay. Hey guys, thanks for watching the video. The link to the entire stream should be on the screen now, as well as the link to the next exam. We will be posting one every day this week, so make sure to check them out. And that's a good place to stop.